You also mentioned that it's important to step out of your comfort zone and strengthen your connections through people, right? So what are some other ways that you may uh, step out of your comfort zone in your daily life? Um, I think I'll talk about it in like both educational and, you know, a daily life context. With Berkeley, one of the things that I realized is how much of an amazing relationship you can have with your professor. So I've always been exposed to more of an Asian education system, having grown up in Hong Kong. And here, we kind of only interact with our professors during the class and maybe if we need extra help. But it doesn't really go beyond, let's say, an assignment or a tough topic to crack within the scope of the subject. But when I was in Berkeley, I remember attending my first class and 10 minutes before the class started, there was like a line of students just by the teacher's desk. And I was so confused. I was like, is there something I'm missing? Is there like a textbook we have to buy? Like, what didn't I do? And then I realized the professor walked in and for those, you know, first 20 minutes because Berkeley time, Every student just spent time introducing themselves to the professor, asking the professor about them, you know, sharing their experience and just talking. And for me, this is such a new experience. I'd never seen this happen before because for me, my relationships with my professors back in Hong Kong or, you know, what I was exposed to in Asia was that, yes, you, you know, this is your professor and you can go to them for help whenever, but that's kind of the extent of your relationship. You don't really talk about, you know, the scope of the subject in their lives or what else they've done in regards to that subject. So this was something completely different for me. And I remember when I was like, okay, I'm going to go try to speak to this professor. I got in line and the whole time I was so nervous because I was like, what do I say to this professor? Like I have no questions to ask. It's not like I have a specific question about a, you know, a concept in the subject that I want to ask. It's just supposed to be me almost like making a new friend. But when I reached it was so easy and the professors were so nice. They would always, you know, welcome me and tell me that it's okay. You know, it's a new learning environment, especially given my background as an international student. And I always just felt so welcome. So I think, um, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone, this might be one aspect in the educational sense. You know, you can speak to your professors. They're also human beings. They're also really cool. They have amazing backgrounds. And sometimes you just never get to know of them unless you speak to them. So that's something that I did personally that, you know, really stepped, put me out of my comfort zone. Another thing was, again, kind of related to the whole Asian and Western, you know, con cultural context difference. When I was in Berkeley, it was so nice to just see everyone smile at each other and, you know, wish each other good morning, have a good day, um, you know, just or at least look at each other with welcoming faces. In Asian culture, that's not very common just because everyone's, you know, caught up in their own lifestyle, busy with their own work, heading somewhere probably late, you know, things aren't going the best way for them so here there's no really concept of greeting each other let alone smiling at each other like if someone smiles at you in hong kong i'll be pleasantly surprised and that'll be that'll you know make my day for sure so when i came back something that i wanted to do which was definitely stepping out of my comfort zone was be that you know the initiator of that kind of culture in hong kong so i remember i came back and suddenly you know just before entering the town like the building that i live in i would greet my security guard with hello good morning and slowly I realized that now they start doing that back to me. So then I realized again that, you know, when you step out of your comfort zone and you do something that you think is going to be very unwelcome, it actually might just flip off and, you know, it might be very welcoming and you'll just get that kind of treatment back for you. And it feels amazing. It's so nice to, you know, even if you're having a bad morning, you're running late to work, to school, if someone says good morning to you and just smiles, it just brightens up your day. And then it makes your perception of the rest of your day much better. So these are just two examples of how I've been stepping out of my comfort zone. But yeah, I'm sure this is just the start because after the, the positiveness that I've gotten out of these two situations, I'm sure like I'll be stepping out of my comfort zone a lot more. Yeah, I mean, that's really great advice for everyone, not just mm -hmm. students, right? Yeah. Um, could you also give a little bit of advice for students just like you and me um, on how to create your first startup or just how to be a successful entrepreneur from your perspective? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, successful really is, you know, determined by the person themselves. It depends on you, how you're going to define your success. But I think a quote that's really stuck with me and resonated with me through the time that I've started college and since I've kind of begun exploring entrepreneurship is that you should be an entrepreneur, not a wantrepreneur. 
And I think that this is a very interesting quote and it can be taken in so many regards. But for me, it just reminds me to stay grounded and make sure I'm not in it to, you know, make it big or have a billion dollar valuation or, you know, get Forbes to cover me, but more because there was a reason why I started this idea or I had this idea and I want to see it come to fruition in the lives of people that it was meant to impact for the better. And that against, you know, the tangible so-called materialistic benefit of having a startup for me will always be so much more enlightening just because getting to see people using something that you created and having it make a better, you know, lifestyle or quality of life for them is a feeling that honestly money can't buy or, you know, you can't get in any other tangible way. And so this is something that's really stuck with me to kind of be thankful for the culture and the quality of life that I get to live and use the skills that I get to, you know, so thankfully um, learn from in, in my education to then apply and make a better lifestyle for those around me. So for example, like I said, I've always lived in Hong Kong and that in that way, I'm a little bit detached from India and in that, you know, I don't get to see what daily life is there. But whenever I go back for summer, you know, just driving by India, I'll see these stalls on the sides of the road, which is the entire house for a family in India. And it just puts into perspective so much for me that while I'm still crying about the fact that, oh, this door isn't opening properly in my house in India, there are people who don't even know what it's like to have a door. And that kind of perspective just really brings me back to, you know, what I can do to help the people who are literally just like me, just unfortunate and make situations much better for them. And when you put yourself in that kind of mindset, you automatically start seeing problems that can actually be solved as opposed to problems that are just first world problems, like I like to say. So from, you know, complaining about it being too hot because your air conditioner isn't working properly to then realizing that in this same scorching heat, there are people who still work day and night or there are people who still live outside without, you know, the privilege of a fan or an air conditioner and then working towards trying to make a difference for those people. I think that's kind of what entrepreneurship is all about. It's seeing a problem and realizing how privileged you are or unprivileged you are and trying to close that gap by using skills that education provides literally everyone with. So I think that's something um, that's really kept me close to entrepreneurship and I hope it does the same for everyone watching. I love that, yeah. Could you also tell us about maybe your experiences with failures and what you've learned from them? Yeah, for sure. Um, as a person, it's just in my personality, I'm pretty naturally competitive. So when I try to do, um, you know, competitions or, you know, initiate ideas, I don't like to see them not happen or I don't like to see that there was a gap in them initially. So for me, failures would be things like, you know, participating in a hackathon and then not winning or, um, you know, putting a lot of effort into an idea and then not seeing the, the merit of it come to life, for example, by winning. And so it's funny that, you know, this is timed so well because just last week, actually, I had a really tough week because I'd participated in two hackathons and one was a case competition, one was a hackathon. And somehow I just didn't, you know, rank in both of them or I didn't get the kind of, you know, achievement that I thought I deserved. And I remember being super upset about this. And the fact that there were two simultaneously just made it even harder for me to cope with it. But then I realized that, you know, in life, you can't always win everything that you do. And again, you know, the difference between being a entrepreneur and an entrepreneur, it doesn't come down to the achievement that you got from that idea in a hackathon. Because 10 years down the line, nobody's going to remember that you ranked first in that hackathon, but everybody's going to remember that you changed the lives of 200,000 people living in an area that isn't where you live. And that's the kind of, you know, achievement that you should rank yourself based on. So I was super bummed about, you know, not making any rank or not winning anything in either one of those two uh, hackathons or case competitions, respectively. But it just put into perspective so much for me that, A, you can't, you really can't win or be satisfied with everything you do. And B, that maybe there's something else coming up for you. 
And just yesterday, actually, um, my team was crowned champion for this ideathon. And it, again, put into perspective for me, you know, one week ago, I was sulking about how I didn't make it, but little did I know the next week I'd have something else to cheer me up. And so for me, kind of hackathons is like, it's like that perfect, you know, cherry on top, uh, winning a hackathon, sorry, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I much rather have it than not. But if it's not there, it doesn't take away from the rest of the learnings that I can get. And I think that's something about failure, especially as students that we need to learn to embrace that um, you're never always going to be successful. And again, I think failure can be defined in so many different ways for different people. For me, it really has to do with, you know, the work that I do and um, the kind of ideas that I come up with and how I want to implement them. But again, for everyone, it could be different. And so for me, that was kind of my definition. And so when that happened, I was like, great, you know, now what? I put so much effort in this, spent three, three days simultaneously, didn't get any sleep, trying to make sure this would look good. And then what? I didn't end up winning. And then it made me realize that actually it has nothing to do with winning. The idea is still an idea. The idea is still feasible. The idea is still going to help change lives. And so that's the kind of motivation that helps me keep working on projects, even if I feel like they haven't got gotten the recognition that they deserve. So again, it comes down to that one line that I keep repeating to myself. You have to be an entrepreneur, not a entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, you're giving us so many great um, perspectives and advice. I can hear you talk all day, honestly. <laughs> and I could talk all day, like I said, I'm <laughs> talking. So yeah, please bear with me. <laughs> no, no, it's great. So you're obviously really good at executing your ideas and following through with all of these, you know, um, problems and solutions that you see on a daily basis. So how do you keep yourself motivated every day? I think, yeah, it comes down to being able to see that idea implementing and how it changes the lives of people around me. Um, you know, the thing is, with all these ideas that I have, they're actually not people close to me or not, you know, areas I'm familiar with. For example, um, with Corona AI, um, thankfully, I don't know anyone infected with the virus or I don't know doctors or nurses, you know, fighting at the front line. But the fact that they're still doing this around the world and there's so many of them is still a story personally connected to me enough for me to want to make a difference for them. And, you know, I always like to think of it like this. God forbid, if I was in a situation like that, what kind of technology or what could I, what kind of solution would I want in place to have made my you know, experience much better. And so that kind of mindset always still, you know, gets me thinking that this could be anyone. It literally could be literally anyone. It could be me for, you know, all I can think of. And that kind of mindset really keeps me going because if it could be me, I would want to make that difference for myself. And so it doesn't make it any different that it's not me now for me to want to be able to execute this. And so I think it comes down to, you know, trying to remember that I am a very small part of a very, very big world. But even me as a small part, if I have the capability and the option and the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of even one person in the rest of the world, I would want to take it. And again, I think this comes down to the fact that ever since I was young, education and its importance has always been instilled into me from the ways that my uh, from the way that my parents have, you know, brought me up. They've always reminded me that I'm so lucky to have good quality education and access this education, and that it's on me. The onus is on me to actually use this education for the right movements and movements that I'm passionate about. And I mean, you can probably tell that I speak a lot, but it's also because I'm from a household that allows me to speak a lot. My opinions are heard of and they're always valued. And because I've grown up like this, I've been taught that if I have an opinion and if I feel strongly about something, I should do everything in my power to help that movement or to initiate some kind of positive change for it. And so, you know, motivation doesn't just come from the person itself. I think your environment is very important. And it's just my environment, I think, that's helped keep me motivated. The fact that, you know, at the dinner table, we're not talking about the latest movie that's come out. We're probably discussing the fact that something's happening in the world and, you know, nothing's being done about it. And then discussing how we as a family can do something to change that for us. And so I think, yeah, it does come down to my environment. And I'm very thankful, you know, that my family, my friends, my teachers, everybody motivate and 
you know, pushes me to keep going and um, creating solutions for people that I might not have interacted with myself. Yeah. So we have one last question for you today, Anushka. Yes. I was wondering if you have any books that you might recommend. Yes, for sure. I actually have two that I would want to recommend. I'm going to hold them up here. I'm not sure if you can see it. So I'll start with this one. This one's called Ringer. This was, I think, one of the first, uh, I'm going to call them hard to read books for me that I read because it was my first copy that didn't have nice colored illustrations or a fancy font or easy diction. And um, I remember not even understanding most of what this book was about and having to ask my teacher so many questions. But this book is very special to me. Like you can see, I wrote my name here and decorated it nice for my first day in school. Um, this is very special to me because it was my segue into reading uh, nonfiction or, you know, bigger, heavier books. And I remember, um, so like a long story short, this, the word ringer is the act of basically killing someone by twisting their neck. And so for a 13 year old, I'm sure, um, as you might have all like squirmed at the thought of it, I was like, why am I being told to read a book like this that, you know, I didn't even know the meaning of this word. And now I need to know such a graphic meaning of this word that I probably hopefully never have to use in my life again. But then it made me realize that your learning never stops and that books should be written in such a way to expose you to situations that you never thought you would have been exposed to otherwise. And so this book taught me a lot about just English in general. My vocabulary really, really um, improved after reading it. But it was also a transition about a, a boy named Palmer from his 10th birthday to how he grew up. And for me as a student who was also growing up through those years, it was a very relevant um, kind of piece of literature that I thought I wanted to follow and learn from um, as I'm growing up. So yeah, this, was, this is one book and its caption is Not All Birthdays Are Welcome, which also put into perspective a lot about birthdays for me. And I now like to celebrate my birthday a lot. But yeah, so this is my first book recommendation. My second one is a little bit also on the same lines is quite a tough read, but it's called Slaughterhouse Five. Um, I really like it one because my favorite number is five and it has five in it, which I thought was a perfect coincidence. But more than that, this was a book I read during my IB studies in English literature. And it's about, um, you know, it's an anti-war novel. And the theme that we were kind of studying in English literature was all about war and stuff like that. And I mean, you know, we've all heard about the fact that wars have happened, but I've never really personally felt connected to one just because, you know, I know that it's brought a lot of like consequences for the world. But as a Gen Z student, I just don't have the kind of exposure or the kind of knowledge of it that someone would have if they lived through it or lived closer to those times. And so this book kind of put into perspective to me, A, how important characters are in books, but also that the Second World War really did change so many people's lives and how important it is for us as a world and a nation to now work towards making sure that there's no such war again. And so I'm going to try not to give away too much about this book, but I think these are two books that you should definitely check out. Um, they're a little bit of a tough read, but I think that's good because it'll only help you improve and it'll also give you a lot of perspective into yeah, literature. So yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And with that, I just want to thank you once again for joining us today. And it was really great speaking to you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you're an amazing host. <laughs>